Recording started. Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the first of our kind of longer webinars. We've been doing these um, Wednesday 15-minute ones for uh, a couple of weeks now, and then for the rest of the school year, once a month, and potentially more if there's a if there's a need for it, we're going to pick a larger topic and expand upon that in an hour-long session. Uh, we're trying to do them over the lunch hour, but uh, it all depends on kind of when rooms are available here on campus to be able to do things. So this one's a little bit earlier than we would have liked. But as with all the app webinars, we will archive these on our website as well. Um, Jenny Anderson's in the room with me. She will be kind of monitoring if there's any questions. So if you have questions, feel free to type them in the chat box. Jenny will answer them if she can, or uh, flag me down if we need to have a little bit more discussion about those kind of things. But otherwise, we'll dive in and just kind of get going here. My name is Jim Stahoviak. I'm the Associate Director of the Iowa Center for Assistive Technology Education and Research here in the College of Education at the University of Iowa. And uh, this project, this, this webinar is part of the Better Future for Iowans project that we've, uh, we've been funded for through the Office of the Provost. We're calling it the Iowa Assistive Technology Professional Development Network. Uh, today we're going to talk about assistive technology consideration. That's really the first part that needs to be completed in, uh, uh, it, it, to provide effective assistive technology tools for students in schools. That, that's, that's what's required by the law. That's what needs to be done. So we'll dive right in and start looking at assistive technology consideration. Uh, I like to start some of my, my, uh, my talks here with a comic, and this is one that I tend to think is, it is pretty humorous. Uh, it's a guy in a wheelchair standing next to the devil, uh, steps leading down to hell, and there's a sign there that says, Welcome to hell, watch your step. At the bottom it says, what'd you expect, ramps? And I kind of look at this and think, well, you know, this, this kind of portrays to kids in school, the kids with disabilities in school. They're like that guy in the wheelchair. They're at a place they don't necessarily want to be to begin with. And then we're not making it any easier for them to get where they need to go. And, and what I think we can do with assistive technology is, you know, give them those ramps that they need and um, make school a less fiery place for them to be at. So. Um, we need to think about that when we're thinking about consideration. We'll start with background here. Uh, I'm sure all of you know what assistive technology is, but I like to hit on this definition when I start some of these things, just to, to, to think a little bit more in depth about what our concept of assistive tech is. Uh, you know, when we look at the definition from the Tech Act of 1988, it says assistive technology is any item, piece of equipment, or product system whether acquired commercially off the shelf, modified or customized, that's used to increase, maintain, or improve the functional capabilities of individuals with disabilities. Um, that's a long, big, wordy definition, but if we break that all down, what that turns into is uh, basically we've got a uh, assistive technology is anything that can help somebody with a disability do something they wouldn't otherwise be able to do. Uh, you know, it's not like assistive technology has to be something that we walk into the assistive technology store and purchase for an individual dis with a disability. If we can figure out a way to use something in a way that's going to benefit that individual, that's going to help them improve, maintain, or increase their functional capabilities, that becomes assistive technology for that individual. One of the best examples that I have is we have a gentleman that comes into our lab that has a neuromuscular disorder, and he struggles with um, accessing the computer, even from a logging on standpoint. It, it, his, his neuromuscular control, is, 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 uh, his fine motor control is not very good, and he has a hard time targeting keys on the keyboard. One of the solutions we came up with for him was using a fingerprint login system. And that's not something that's designed as assistive technology. We came up with a customized way to use that uh, as assistive technology. Uh, a fingerprint login system, I'm sure you're all fami familiar with that. Basically, it's a, uh, a sensor that you link your fingerprint to your name and password, and you touch the sensor, and it logs you in. Designed for security purposes, but we've, we've saw this as an option to use as a one-touch login for this particular individual. So we linked up his name and password, and now um, all he has to do is come in and touch that, uh, that sensor, and he's logged into the computer. Uh, so for him, he might miss it one or two times, maybe three times, but he usually gets it by the fourth or fifth try, and that's still even faster than trying to type in a name or password. So that's a, you know that's a way to use something that, that uh, that's a way to use something that you customize it 
uh, as assistive technology or modify its use a little bit. Again, just think when you think in terms of assistive technology, it doesn't have to be something you order from an assistive technology website. It can be anything that you've got in the classroom that you can use in a different way to help somebody with a disability improve, maintain, or increase functional capabilities. That's the definition of the device. Uh, you know, another thing we need to think about, especially in consideration, is um, assistive technology services. And services refer to anything that directly assists a child with a disability, the selection, acquisition, or use of AT. That can include, you know, evaluating, purchasing, selecting, designing, fitting, adapting, customizing. But the key things, especially with consideration, is um, thinking about training, training for the user, training for the user's family, technical assistance that, that might need to be done with this. Because it's, we can't just hand the kid a device and, and expect them to be able to use it successfully. They need to be able, to, they need to have some training on that, as do teachers, parents, anybody that's going to be working with that student, that's going to be potentially working with that student. There's a lot of common assistive technology misconceptions out there, and, and, and um, there's some that we hear from the educators, and then there's also some from the assistive technology providers end that we need to be careful that we don't fall into. Um, some of the things that we hear from teachers is, you know, AT, we don't want to use it in the classroom. It provides a substitute for classroom instruction, or it teaches a basic skill. It doesn't do either one of those. Assistive technology is all about access. It's all about providing access to an individual um, to be able to learn in the classroom, to be able to learn those basic skills, to be able to um, uh, work around the inability to learn those, those basic skills as well. But again, the key, the key word with assistive technology is all about providing access. You know, I've also heard teachers say assistive technology does all of the work for the student, and that's why they, they don't want to use it in class. When in reality, you know, the student's probably working twice as hard because they have to work to be able to get that assistive technology to work, and then they also have to do the class work. Uh, one of the examples I gave to a teacher that said this to me was, um, you know, a student can use speech recognition software, and they're just getting text down on paper in a different way. It's not like they pick up a microphone and say, write a paper on the Civil War and have it spit out 20 pages on the Civil War. They're still doing the composing. They're just getting it down on paper in a little bit different way. You know, another common misconception is that all assistive technology has to be expensive. And assistive technology itself, uh, it, it, it is somewhat expensive. It's been coming down in price quite a bit in the last decade or so as a lot of the features that we consider assistive have, have begun being built into tools that um, any individual might be able to use. But uh, there's also several low-tech options that might be helpful to folks. Pencil grips, highlighters, highlighter tape, uh, things like that can be helpful for students. Uh, and those are, those are just low-tech solutions to, um, to assistive technology. You know, another thing that we hear is that it provides an unfair advantage to students. Well, it doesn't really provide an unfair advantage. What it does is it, it takes them to, the, to maybe that same starting point as everybody else and allows them to progress at the same level as everyone else. I mean, you wouldn't say that uh, a student who wears glasses has an unfair advantage against everybody else in the class, but glasses are considered assistive technology. So you wouldn't tell a student with glasses to leave their glasses at the door when they come into the classroom. It's just the same as you wouldn't want to tell a student that might need to use text reading software or speech recognition software to leave that in the, uh, at the door coming into the classroom as well. So these are things that we, we, we want to try and um, work against these attitudes in the classroom, but we've got to make sure that we don't fall into some, some common AT misconceptions as well. Uh, a common one is that assistive technology use is the goal. That's really not often the case, and, and very rarely is assistive technology used the goal. The goal is typically going to be uh, some academic goal, and assistive technology is going to be used to help reach that goal. So uh, it's never the goal to use text reading software, to be able to use speech recognition software, or to use even a communication device. The goal would be to communicate, or to be able to write, or to be able to access printed text, and you would use assistive technology to help you get there. You know, another thing that people fall into a lot is the newest assistive technology is always the best. Well, that's not necessarily the case. I mean, if, if, unless there's brand new features in that latest update that somebody needs to have to work, uh, to have it work properly, or it, 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 you have to update it to work with your computer system, 
if everything's working just fine for the student, there isn't necessarily a reason to upgrade just because the latest AT has come out. Um, if that student works well, is comfortable using it, and uses it effectively, I would venture to say that you probably should just let things be and, and, and maybe explore an upgrade at a later time when, when maybe there's new, new features that really might benefit or, somebody, or, or the, the old software just isn't working uh, up to par as it should be for the student. You know, another thing that we people want is to be able to have assistive technology chosen strictly based on disability, and that just can't be done. Everybody is different. Everybody has uh, different needs. Everybody reacts to things differently. So you need to make sure that you evaluate each individual on a case-by-case -case basis. We can't just throw in a box and say, you have dyslexia, this is what you need. You have cerebral palsy, this is what you need. We need to do things on an individual basis. You know, also, once AT is chosen, the student's all set. Not the case either. We need to make sure that training's provided for that individual and training's provided for the people that work with that student as well, as that's what's going to make it successful. Uh, I think about my mom and dad. They know just enough technology-wise to be dangerous. If my dad got an iPhone and all he wanted to do with it is use it for email. He, had, he has no idea what the other capabilities are on there. And even setting up email is difficult for him. And had we just handed him that device, he probably wouldn't have been able to figure it out on his own. We need to do a little bit of training uh, in the background of something like that. So th that, that, that plays for most people with technology. It certainly holds true for kids with disabilities as well. There needs to be training for the student, for the teacher, and for the parents also. And you know, we think that we set students up with these great systems are automatically always going to use assistive technology. And that's not the case. There's only so much that we can do. We can set them up with something that we think they're going to use. We can use their input to make sure that it's something that they like. We can give them opportunities to use it in the classroom. If they're not going to use it, sometimes they're just not going to use it. We, but we can only take it so far. Some of it at that point is then on the student. So let's talk about assistive tech and the IEPs and what's required and what we need to do. And, and, and the one legal requirement is that assistive technology has to be considered on every IEP. And that's why we're here today to talk a little bit about consideration and what that actually means. But once it's considered, if it's written into the IEP, the district has to provide a few things. They have to provide an evaluation. Then once the device is chosen they have to and written in, they have to provide that device. Other than personal, other than uh, surgically implanted devices, they don't have to provide those, but they have to provide the device. They have to either purchase it or lease it. And then this often gets overlooked, but they're also supposed to provide proper training for the individual, the necessary staff, and the family, and, and so that we see seamless transition into using assistive technology in the school. They also have to provide any modification or repair of the device that, that comes about. Now, they cannot say that we don't have the funding to do this or that there's not somebody locally who provides these things. They have, once the AT is written into the IEP, they have to provide, they have to come up with the funding to buy it, and they also have to find somebody locally to, or somebody to, to bring in to help get things rolling with that assistive technology. Now, on the flip side of this, anything that the district purchases belongs to that district. So. When they buy something, they can kind of dictate how it's used. Unless you write into the IEP that students should take this home for homework, the district can say you're not taking that device or that software home. Also, when a student moves or transitions in a, uh, a different um, or graduates, that assistive technology is not going to follow them. That belongs to the district. It's up to either the new school or the student once they've graduated to get that technology if they want to continue using it. Now, some of these companies do a nice thing where, um, and one that comes to mind is Text Help, who makes Read and Write Gold. If you have a student that's been using Read and Write Gold and graduates high school, uh, that's typically about a $650 program. Text Help will sell that gra new graduating senior uh, a copy of it for $100 so that they, continue, can, they can continue using it in their future endeavors. So some companies do do some things like that. But again, the, the district has to provide the AT, but then it also belongs to that district. And, and they can kind of dictate how it's used, and it doesn't necessarily follow the student. So where can assistive technology be included in the IEP? Well, it can be included as part of an annual or short-term goal. And you know, an example might be, again, we, it, it can be part of the goal. It shouldn't necessarily be the goal. As part of the goal, it could be something like using an adapted computer keyboard, Rachel, will type 12 words per minute with no errors over 10 or more consecutive trials. Now, notice in here, where, where we put the AT, it's, it's as an adapted computer, oops, and 
Sorry, I was trying to get fancy and use a uh, use a pen here on the screen, but apparently it's not going to let me do that. Let me try one more time and just highlight here. We're using an adapted computer keyboard. Nope, it's not going to let me do it. We'll stop playing around with that. Using an adapted computer keyboard. Notice I didn't say um, using a big key keyboard or using a specific type of keyboard because once that's written in, then the school has to provide that particular thing. If you go through the consideration process, and we'll talk about this again in a minute, if you go through the consideration process and you come up with an idea of a type of tool that might work for the student, write that into the IEP. With, that's just vague enough, like your adapted computer keyboard, let's just try a bunch of different things. And then once we find through an evaluation the one that's going to work best for that student, then we might adapt the IEP to change it to the, the specific name. But by having adapted computer keyboard, it gives us an opportunity to play around with different tools and try different things that would fall under that category to make sure we get the right thing for that student. And we can also put uh, AT in the enumeration of supplementary aids and services necessary to maintain the student in a least restrictive environment. You know, for example, we could say something like a student with multiple disabilities can make progress with a computer with speech recognition but not without. That would be a good way to put that in there. And then in the list of related services necessary for the student to benefit from education, that's where we might put training in there and include training on assistive technology, again, for the students, parents, and necessary uh, staff uh, to work with. Now, who ideally would be on a, on a team with, uh, when we're looking at assistive tech in the IEPs? You have to have a student, teacher, parent, but if we can get therapists involved, physical therapists, occupational therapists, speech language therapists, they, they'll have different perspectives as to what that student's going to need physically uh, from a speech perspective in terms of assistive tech. You can get a special ed professional, that's great. If you can get an AT expert, that's phenomenal. I mean, you can add counselors, medical professionals, psychologists in there. But look at the last two. Those are the two that I wanted to key in on, and that's kind of why I put, up, put this slide up, is the paraprofessional and the IT professional. When we did a survey across the state a few years ago looking at um, assistive technology usage, usage in K-12 settings, we found that often paraprofessionals and IT professionals can be either the biggest roadblocks to using AT in the classroom or some of the biggest promoters of using AT in the classroom. And the reason being with paraprofessionals is they usually work most closely with the individual with disabilities. They, they might work one-on-one -on -one with them. So they're going to know what that student likes, what they're able to use, and then the para also has to be comfortable with those things. So having that para involved in the, in the process in the IEP to be able to indicate what, uh, what they've seen from that student or what they're comfortable using to be real helpful and, and also allowing them to sit in and hear what that consideration piece is to know what they're going to be working with is important. IT professionals are another big one to have involved. These guys, uh, if you can make friends with them, you're going to be uh, you're going to be ahead of the game in terms of an assistive technology person in the school. Because these guys are very protective of their networks, very protective of the security of the system as they should be, and oftentimes they're not familiar with some of these tools and what their needs are and what they and why they might need to make exceptions in certain areas for some assistive technology tools. Um, Having them involved in the process and kind of hearing and learning about these things and seeing why they need to let certain things through or um, why they need to make sure things work on their network, uh, you're going to be able to get, you're going to, if you can get them on board then, you're going to be able to have a much easier time using assistive technology throughout your school. So if you can get paras and IT people on board and part of the team, that's going to be real helpful for you. Let's talk about the basics of consideration, because that, that is why we're here today after getting this background stuff done. Consideration, as we said, is required by IDEA on every IEP. You have to at least think about whether or not assistive technology would benefit the student who, is, uh, who you're talking about. And you have to consider both devices and services. And really, this should involve some thought. I mean, it goes without saying it should involve some thought, but unfortunately, a lot of times, People get to that checkbox on, on, I think, page B of the IEP, and they basically consideration consists of, does this student need AT? No, and they move on. You know, that's a, a five-second thought there. Really, it should be a discussion that lasts about three to five minutes. It really shouldn't be any more than 20 minutes. If you start getting into that, that much time, we need to maybe revisit this at a later time. And it should, it should be led by somebody with assistive technology knowledge. We shouldn't have people that really don't understand assistive technology leading you through that and just kind of blasting through that part of the, of the uh, consideration process, of the IEP process. You really need to think about what the student can and can't do and whether or not there's tools 
that can help that individual. And I'm going to show you some forms that you can follow in a, in a, in a few minutes here that are going to it's going to help you walk through those um, those particular uh, that consideration process and come up with a good solid plan for assistive technology for the student. Um, when you're considering this again, assistive technology, we talked about this before. It has to um, it has to address access to the curriculum and specifically design goals that you already have. So this should be done after the goal has been written. AT, again, is not the goal. AT supports the goal. So the goal should be written, and then we should look at, okay, how has the student been doing in terms of these goals before? Are there ways that we could maybe help them enhance how they progress toward those goals? And is assistive technology one of them? And then what kind of assistive technology might we want to use from there? Also, just because we're considering assistive technology, it does not necessarily apply a, a mandate for an evaluation of services. You have to consider on everything, and as we'll see in a minute, no, the student doesn't need assistive tech it is a very reasonable conclusion, as, as long as you've considered it thoroughly and, and, and thought about the different areas the student might be participating in and, and the issues that student might have. As long as you've thought about those thoroughly, an answer of no, they don't need assistive technology is certainly uh, a viable solution. Um, so we talk about consideration and assessment. Those are two different things. Assessment is generally longer than consideration. It, we're looking for a specific tool in assessment. You can see down there on the bottom of the slide, the big difference is that consideration looks at a general need. Is, this, is there a general need for assistive technology with this student? Assessment looks at a specific tool. Okay, assist, assessment typically follows consideration as well. So when, when we've considered something, we determine maybe there's a general need and we need to look at an assessment from there to find out the specific tool that's going to work for the individual. The consideration usually occurs during the IEP meeting. Assessment is outside of the fact. And assessment is usually more detailed and it's going to result in an acquisition of new information. Consideration is really just going over information you already have and trying to use that to determine whether or not a student is going to need assistive technology. I'll pause for just a second here and find out, does anybody have any questions? Uh, if you have questions, just take a minute and type them into the chat box. I'll give you a second. If not, we'll, we'll move on in just a second here. But we'll give you just a second to um, kind of digest some of the stuff we've talked about already and see if there's any questions out there. OK. So we'll keep going. So with consideration, you know, oftentimes people just think it's a can the student do it or can the student not do it? And if the student can't do whatever they're supposed to, then we introduce assistive technology. That's not necessarily always the case. These are some of the things that we ought to be looking at when we're considering assistive technology, not just can or can't. But you know, if, if assistive technology would enable a student to perform functions that could be achieved by no other means, then we need to think about using assistive technology. And that's kind of the can they, can't they routine. But then we start looking at some other things as well. If it enables a student to approximate normal fluency or rate, a level of accomplishment which couldn't be achieved by other means, then maybe we should look at assistive technology. So there, we're going to use, I'm going to use writing as an example uh, quite a bit throughout this. So if a student can write, but when the, while the rest of the class is writing a paragraph, this student's writing a sentence, that's not normal. Maybe what we need to be able to do, maybe what we need to do is look at some type of technology to help improve the rate of writing. Maybe we need to look at giving them speech recognition software to increase their rate and keep it on par with the rest of the class. If it provides access for participation in programs or activities which would otherwise be closed to the individual. So, you know, if there's a school play that is required that everybody participates in, but this student with a disability can't participate in that without assistive technology, then maybe we need to look at an assistive technology tool for participation. And, you know, if it incre increases endurance or the ability to persevere on com complex tasks that would otherwise be too laborious, then that needs to be included. Then it needs to be included in the IEP. So again, if we're thinking about writing, the student can write and keep up normal fluency, but it has to stop every five minutes for a 10-minute break because uh, it's just too laborious for them to do it from there. Then we need to look at providing an assistive technology tool that would help them with writing. Um, this is one of my favorite ones. It enables the student to concentrate on learning tasks rather than mechanical tasks. Then we need to think about providing assistive technology and writing it into the, the IEP. I used to work with a guy who had a son who had Asperger's, and, and he was a very smart kid, 
if you asked him something and you asked him to explain it, he could explain it to you. But when it came time to write that down in the classroom with a, with a pen, pencil and, and paper, his handwriting was affected by his Asperger's and his fine motor control was, so his handwriting wasn't perfect. And then that really bothered him that it wasn't perfect. So he'd keep writing something and erasing and rewriting and erasing and rewriting. And pretty soon, the rest of the class had several sentences to the paragraph, and he's working on one or two words. But again, if you ask him to explain what he wanted to write to you, he'd be able to write that clearly or, or speak that clearly to you. So what they did was they looked at, oh, all right, let's remove that mechanical task of writing. This kid is focusing on the physical task of writing words down. He's not focusing on content. And what they got him was a portable word processor. And a portable word processor, I think it was called the Fusion at the time, or the Fusion was the tool they got him. Um, it's basically just a, a keyboard with a small screen, no other distractions for a computer, and all you do is, is, is type on it and produce written work that way. And for this student, removing that handwriting issue and allowing him to type his work, it, it, made, a, it made a world of difference. He was able to keep up and, and, and write the same level as everybody else in his class, and, and his focus on content improved. And that was all done by removing the focus on the mechanical task of writing and allowing him to focus on the, on the task of learning and, and getting down content. Um, you know, it provides greater access to information. We should provide assistive technology. We should include it in the IEP. If it supports normal social interactions with peers or adults, it should be in there. And if it supports particip participation in a least restrictive environment, then we need to include assistive technology in the IEP. So those are all questions. That's all kind of things that we should be looking at when we consider assistive technology in an IEP meeting. So during consideration, there are four potential consideration conclusions. And here's our four solutions. We'll walk through them one by one here. The first one is that current interventions are working and that no assistive technology is needed. As I said earlier, as long as you think about it and you think about how the student interacts in the environment and what issues the student might have and whether or not technology can work and you determine that technology isn't really necessary, that's fine. At that point, we can check no that we don't use assistive technology on the IEP, and that's just fine. And as long as you've considered it and thought about it and thought it thoroughly through what the student's doing, current interventions are working and no AT is needed is a valid conclusion. The second conclusion is that assistive technology is already being used or trial, and that the IEP team should then write AT into the IEP so that it continues. And so, so maybe you've started using AT since the last IEP meeting, and they haven't, um, it hasn't been written into the IEP. While you're considering it, it may come out in the, in the discussion that, hey, this student already is using assistive technology, and it's been successful. And in that case, it should be written into the IEP. And if you've already been using something and it's been successful, that's when you can use a product name or you can be more specific and put something in like, you know, the student's if the student's been using a text reader and they've been using Kurzweil, you're going to write in, Kurz, the student will use Kurzweil 3000 to do whatever they need to be doing. And that way, it's, uh, that ensures that the tool that they've been using is what they're going to be continually using. And it's going to, it's going to move on with that student when they transition to other schools, when they transition within the district into different schools, or if they move as well. But it's not, at that point, when they've been using something successfully, then it's okay to write in the, um, the, the specific name of the, of the tool. Uh, it, it's before that that we would, we would be a little bit more vague. And that's what we're, we're going to get to our next consider, uh, consideration conclusion. And that conclusion is that uh, new assistive technology should be tried. It, it, and if you come up with the conclusion that new assistive technology should be tried, what you want to do is describe the features of the assistive technology in the IEP so that you can try other specific things and come up with a tool that's going to work for the student. So for example, if you thought you know, Birdmaker might be something that you would want to use, but you weren't sure and you wanted to try some other things, it, you might cite that in the IEP as visual strategies. You might want to use visual strategies, and that allows you to try BoardMaker and IntelliTools and some other things and determine which one's going to work. With IntelliTools, you might call that media, multimedia interactive services. Kurzweil 3000, instead of writing that in, and when we're looking at a new assistive technology tool for somebody, we might write in text reading software. But once we find out that that text reading software that works best is Kurzweil, then we can amend that IEP to indicate that Kurzweil is going to work best for that student. You know, Fusion, we could write that in as a portable word processor. 
or big key keyboard, we could write that in as an alternative keyboard. So again, the key here is if we're deciding that a student might need assistive technology, or that they need assistive technology, but we're not sure exactly what yet, we want to write in to the IEP, we want to write in features of that type of technology. That's going to allow us to, again, trial different titles. Then once we've determined the title that's going to work, we want to go back and amend that IEP to include the title so that we ensure that the student gets the technology that they're comfortable with and that they're going to use effectively. If, if there's any questions about clearing that up, let me know and, and I'll address those. But again, when we first put things in, it's uh, slightly vague. We talk about characteristics of the tool. Once we've determined the proper tool, that the exact tool is going to work, then we amend it to make sure that the name of the tool is in there. The fourth and final consideration conclusion uh, is that the IEP team does not have enough information to make a decision, and, and they need to request assistance to gather proper information. And, and if you start, that's where you come into play. We start sitting there, and it goes beyond five, ten, twenty minutes of discussion in the IEP meeting. Then we need to we need to have a separate discussion about that. We need to look a little bit further into what's going on, and then and then reevaluate and come back to the IEP later with assistive tech. So those are your four conclusions. No, it's not needed. It's already being used, and we need to make sure it gets into the IEP. Yes, we need assistive technology, or we need more information. Um, there's a group of, of uh, assistive technology professionals that a while ago got together and formed the uh, Quality Indicators and Assistive Technology Group, QIAT. And actually, if you're not uh, involved in that right now, if you go to QIAT.org, you can sign up for their listserv, and I'll get Jenny to type that into the chat box as well. And it's QIAT.org. They have a listserv there where anybody who's anybody in assistive technology and education is a part of that, and there's constantly um, questions and solutions and topics being thrown out on that listserv. I would recommend that as a great resource for uh, learning more about assistive technology in the K-12 setting. But anyway, this group, um, led by Joy Zabaya and Gail Bowser in 2000, put together quality indicators for consideration of AT needs. And these are the, the things that um, you know you're doing it right if this is going on. And, and the five points that they kind of came up with there were um, if AT devices and services are considered for all students with disability, regardless of type and severity, you're doing it right. And again, that has to be done. That, that's that's in, the, in the law. You have to consider it for every student. If the IEP team has knowledge and skills to make informed decisions, it's, it, you're doing it well. So again, if that discussion is being led by somebody that's familiar with assistive technology. If a continuum of devices and services are explored. So again, we mentioned that there are low-tech options that could be beneficial. If we look at everything from low-tech to high-tech and that's being explored, then we're doing it right. If decisions regarding the need for AT services uh, and devices are made based on access to the curriculum and the student's goals and objectives. So again, if we're, writing, if we're not saying that the use of the technology is the goal, but providing access to the other goals uh, through assistive technology is, is how we're doing this, then we're doing it correctly. And if decisions uh, about AT are being made with support, of supporting data, then, then we're doing it correctly. And again, so once we decide we need to use AT, we need to start collecting some data on, on how that student is doing before the use of AT, collecting data after the use of AT to show that that assistive technology is, uh, is making a difference, then we're doing things correctly. Um, from the South Carolina Department of Education, their AT specialist came up with five steps to AT consideration. Again, follows basically the same thing. You know, you review where the student currently is, you review their goals, you identify the tasks that they're doing to accomplish these goals, and then you determine if their functional capabilities allow them to perform those tasks across the environment. And if they don't, then we look at providing support. So that's kind of a simple five-step way to break down what you're doing in consideration. Review the, the present level of accommodation, review the goals, identify tasks, look at how the student's doing with those tasks, and if they aren't doing what they aren't are performing the way they should be, what kind of supports can we add to that to make it more successful? That's the simplest way to break down consideration. When we think about this, too, one of the things we ought to be using uh, for consideration is, is the SET framework. That's S-E-T-T. -T. And it, that was a framework developed by Joy Zabala to kind of 
come up with information and come up with the proper information for making sure we're making good decisions on assistive technology. And what SET stands for is Student Environment Task and Tools. And this is all about gathering information on those students. And what we look at for these students, when we talk about the student, we talk about what they can and can't do, what their abilities are, what their disabilities are. When we talk about the environment, that's an important piece that a lot of people overlook. We talk about what the classroom is like that they're in. We talk about who might be in that classroom that could help. We talk about what kind of technology is already in there. We talk about the task. We talk about what they need to do. And then from there, once we have the student, the environment, the tasks, we can come up with tools that might help them be able to do those things based on what they can and can't do, what's available, what the environment's like, and what they have to be able to do. When we're talking about the student, I mean, we don't have set questions that we have to ask, but these are the kind of things you might ask about the student to, to draw out information from those folks that know different things about the student. You know, what do they need to be able to do? What are their current abilities? What are their current limitations? What are their special needs? All of those things are important to know about the student. With the environment, we might ask, you know, what are, what's currently available in the environment? What's the physical arrangement? What's the instructional arrangement? What supports are there? Um, you know, what resources, what people are in there, what resources might be available to the student in that environment. Those are the types of things we need to know to, to make successful assistive technology decisions. Tasks, you know, we want to find out what activities take place, what the student has to do. Um, that's what we find out task-wise. And then from there, again, tools we look at based on what we've seen, what we've seen with the student, with the environment, with the tasks, what tools do we, what, what tools can we use there. And with that, um, the other thing we'll point out too is you can do the first three in any order. You can, you can look at the environment first, then the task, then the student, any order there. You always have to do the tools last. You have to gather that other information before you can realistically come up with positive tools that are going to work for that student. So I'm going to show you a few different consideration guides that you can use. And, and if you like, um, let Jenny know in the chat box, and we can, I can probably get these posted on our website alongside the webinar so that you can download these and use them on their own. Um, but the first one we're going to look at is one out of Wisconsin. It's called the WADI Assistive Technology Consideration Guide. WADI, um, I don't believe they have funding anymore, but it used to be the Wisconsin Assistive Technology Initiative. And this is kind of what they came up with. And we'll see some aspects of what we talked about with consideration right here. If we look here, basically what you do with this is you you check the tasks where the student might be struggling, and they list a bunch of tasks here. Um, motor, aspects of writing, computer access, composing written material, communication, reading, learning, and there's more on the next page. Then we add, add three boxes here, and the, and the first box is, you know, currently completes the task with, with special accommodations, describe how that might be done. If they currently complete the task with assistive technology tools, describe it. And if they need new assistive technology tools, describe what they might need here. So if you, if you decide that they're, they're fine with what they're doing and they don't need any special accommodations, you don't even bother checking the box. Otherwise, you describe what they are doing or what you think they might need. And then at the very end, we can do that through uh, more tasks. And at the end, it asks, are there AT services so, uh, that they might need? Are they going to need training? Is there, um, is there evaluation that might be done? If yes, you kind of describe it here. So that's kind of one of your um, assistive technology consideration guides you might look at. Um, if we take a look at this next one, uh, Georgia, the Georgia Project for Assistive Technology adopt, adapted the WADI guide and added a little bit. And I think this one, you can walk through this one a little bit better uh, through the, the consideration process. I, I like this one a lot. We'll look at one from Iowa next that I also like a lot. But let's take a look at the Georgia one. So in Georgia, uh, for this consideration checklist, you'd start up here and you'd fill in the student information. And then in part one, what it asks is to identify any area that's keeping the student from accomplishing their uh, IEP goals and any area where the student or any area where the student's already using AT. So we see those same areas from the Wisconsin thing here. And we can go through and check areas where the student is struggling. And once we've done this, we jump over to this box. We see the arrow pointing us over here. It says here was one or more area identified. And if we, th if we found that the students weren't having problems in any of these areas listed here, we would check no. And at that point, consideration would be complete. If we did check one of these 
options, we would say yes, and we would go here to part two. So part two says, list the area identified in part one, specify the task the students are unable to do and the environment that this takes place in. So we see the set framework kind of embedded into this. So you would list, okay, if the student can't, is struggling with reading, we'd say reading is the area. And we'd talk about the environment where that takes place and say maybe there's already computers in there, but it's a noisy environment. They'd have to have a headset kind of thing. Then we'd look at briefly list the strategies that are already being used. And so we'd say at this point, maybe there really isn't something that's already being used for the individual. We'd talk about what already is being used. And then we'd move on to C here. And C says, is the student able to complete tasks at his or her ability with any of these special strategies that are already being used? We say yes, the current strategy, we find that they can do it with what's already being done. Then we'd say the current strategies are adequate and consideration is complete. The other thing might be yes, the student's current use of AT is adequate, consideration is complete here if they're already using AT. And it just reminds you to document that in the IEP so that that is there. And then third is, okay, if we've, we've looked at the student, the task, the environment, we've looked at what isn't going on, what they aren't being uh, accommodated with, we'd say no and we'd go to part three. So with part three, we'd check here either one of two things. One, AT is required. The IEP team knows what they're going to use and they'll address this in the student's IEP. Or AT may be required and we need additional information and we're going to look into it a little bit further. So that's where we see all three of our, or all four of our consideration conclusions popping up here. And this kind of walks us nicely through how, how uh, that's going to be used. So that's, one, that's another one that I like, and, and I think that gives us a good idea of what we should be talking about in the consideration process within the IEP meeting. I want to show you the one we're using in Iowa now. This was developed by the Iowa Assistive Technology Liaisons, and we kind of took pieces from all of these other ones and laid it out into our own, uh, our own form here. And this is actually now on the um, Iowa Department of Education's website under Assistive Technology on there. So anybody can go and download this and use this. And from what I've understood, what people have been doing is filling this out in IEP meetings and then attaching it to the IEP to show some documentation at the end. But here we've got the information about the student up here. And then we dive right in. And instead of having a checkbox, what this asks us to do is select the instructional or access areas in which the student's experiencing difficulty completing goals. And it gives you yes or no. So it really forces you to think and circle one or the other in each of these areas written here. And if you've decided yes, you can add here the identified goal that they'd be struggling with. And then we jump into the conclusion right from there. So we've decided you know, they're struggling in these areas. And here's our three things that we can say. They're struggling, but the, or the student's needs are being met without assistive technology. So if we said no to all of these, we'd probably circle this box here and say, no, that we considered AT, but it's not needed on the IEP. The second box would be the student's I, needs are being met with AT, and we want to list the items related on that IEP. And the third area might be assistive tech concerns continue to exist, further assessments necessary. And then you'll see right down here the set frameworks breaking, broken down. So we can write out what the student's needs are, what the environment's like, and it gives us an example, classes and situations where help is needed. And then the tasks. What are the tasks the student needs to be able to do to accomplish daily task goals and benchmarks? And once we've finished these three, then we can start looking at tools. And it says here under tools, complete this column last. Again, it's reminding us that the tools piece should come last. The back side of this particular form gives us some ideas. And this is what I, we've heard that a lot of teachers really like. And a lot of people that are going over the AT uh, in the consideration piece in the IEP really like. And that's that we've got um, each of those categories. And within each of those categories, we list examples of what might be used. We don't list product names here, but we list examples of what might be used. And we can write this into the IEP in that way and then further investigate to determine which title they might need. And the way that this is written as well is this is written from top to bottom going from low tech to high tech. So if we look at maybe in the reading area here, you'd see low tech things, books adapted for access, low tech modifications to text handheld device to read individual words, use of pictures or symbols. Then we start getting up into like the mid-tech 
electronic text, modified electronic text, and then high tech text reader, scanner with optical character recognition, and text reader, text reader with study skills support. So again, we have each one of those areas that's listed here as an area where students might struggle, and we've listed potential assistive technology tools from low tech to high tech that might benefit them. And again, we can find that that list or that uh, form on the Department of Ed's website, and we will also add that to uh, our website right next to the link to the webinar, so you've got access to that as well there. So those are the, the forms. Uh, at this point, we're pretty close to wrapping it up. Is there any questions that anybody would have on consideration in the form, the consideration forms that we looked at on how considerations should be conducted? I mean, I think my goal is to have made this so that you understand consideration needs to be a little bit more than just do they need it, yes or no, and kind of the steps that we need to walk through for proper consideration on the IEP. We'll give you just a second if you have questions to enter those. If not, we'll wrap it up in just a second here. Okay. I'll give you time again for questions at the end. But then once we've you know considered AT, do we have something there, Jay? No, okay. Once we've considered AT, we need to match that to the individual as well. And, and what we need to do is we need to think about why a user might abandon assistive technology. And here's your common reasons. You know, uh, abandoning assistive technology, stopping using it, it might happen because of a change in the needs of the user. Um, if the device isn't easy to come by, they're probably not going to use it. If it doesn't work well, they're not going to use it. Um, but here's where we talk about in consideration, too. Part of the big thing we need to include in consideration is the user's opinion. And when we're talking about what the student needs and we look at the type of technology they're going to use, if the student doesn't want to use it, they're not going to use it. So they have to be considered in the process. If they're not considered in the process, they often don't, uh, they often abandon the technology. And also for children, school, school age students, abandonment might be tied to others. If the parent doesn't promote it at home, the teacher doesn't promote or provide options for it to be used in school, if somebody else in their environment doesn't, doesn't use it uh, or doesn't provide opportunities to use it, then they may abandon it in the classroom. So what we kind of need to look at when we look at the student technology match is we start by thinking what are their goals, what are their dreams, and how can we use assistive technology there. We figure out the need for AT, then we just determine that the person's ready for AT, how it fits their lifestyle, and if, um, if they're comfortable with using it. And then we want to consider these factors when we look at assistive technology. We want to make sure that it uh, performs well, that it's elegant and simple, it's reliable, safe, uh, it, it's easy to use for adults, it's cost effective, it's fairly normal, you know, the family accepts it, the culture accepts it, it's age appropriate, but the key thing is right here, that it's personally accepted by the student. We could come up with the greatest system in the world if it's not personally accepted by the student, they're not going to want to use it. That was just a short little wrap, and we'll get into person technology match in a future webinar, but I'd like to open it up for questions. Again, we want to consider things just to wrap it up. The, the summary of it is we want to make sure we consider, because we have to consider based on the law, the consideration needs to be a real discussion about goals and whether or not they're being met, and if there's tools that can help students do that. It needs to be led by somebody that understands assistive technology. And there should be documentation on that, like one of those three documents I showed you. And also, we need to make sure we have four conclusions. We, it can be that we can conclude that no AT is needed, that AT is already being used and needs to be written into the IEP, that we need to explore the use of AT, or that we need to find out more information. So, with that, does anybody have any questions that we that they need to, that they like to have addressed? We'll give you a couple minutes here to put those in while you're. Entering questions there while we're waiting on those, I'll just remind you that um, oh, I'll thank you for attending the, the webinar today, and I hope this was helpful. At some point, we'll get something out there to allow you to have uh, to give us some feedback on what we're talking about and what we've been talking about. If there's any um, if, if there's any topics you'd like to see in the future, please feel free to email, email myself or uh, Jenny Anderson. My email is James Dash S T A C H O W IAK at uiowa.edu. And Jenny's email is uh, Jennifer Dash Anderson, A N D E R S E N, at uiowa.edu. And we certainly take into account 
anything that you want to you want to hear more about. But again, we'll be doing these hour-long lunchtime webinars once once a month, and every Wednesday we'll be doing those 15-minute um, app webinars. This week we'll be looking at Pro Loco to go at three o'clock on Wednesday. Jenny, any questions in the chat box there? Nothing. All right. Well, if you got nothing for me. Um, I appreciate your time. I hope you got something from this, and uh, please share with friends that this will be available in an archived format if they'd like to watch it at a later date on our website. If you want to get in contact with me off the webinar, feel free to do so as well. Uh, thanks for attending, and uh, hopefully we'll see you guys on Wednesday.